Tonight, inshallah, in the tafsir of Surah Al-Kahf, we will understand verse number 15. In our last session, uh, we began talking about the ayat in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explained the stories of the people of the cave uh, in detail. A uh, few ayat before, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala summarizes the entire story. And now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for one page and a half, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will tell the entire story in detail. So in the last session, we understood one of the principles of correcting someone, which we understood from the people of the cave, and which is that when you want to correct someone, you never use the word you, you always <coughs> use the word we. Just like the people of the cave, when they wanted to point out the idolatry <coughs> of their people, they said that if we were to do, uh, sorry, uh, the, the ayah says that, min dunihi, that we will never ever call anyone, uh, we will never ever worship anyone except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, but if we were to do this, if we were to call anyone, even though they are not idolaters, they don't worship idols, their nation, their people, they are worshipping idols. <coughs> they are committing idolatry, but they are not worshipping idols. But at the same time, when they talk about this thing, they didn't say that if we were to do this, we were to do what you are doing. They said, if we were to do it, we were to do this, لَقَدْ قُلْنَا إِذَنْ شَتَطَ Then we would have said something that is extremely wrong. So meaning that, that they are not pointing out the faults of other people. They take the fault of their own community and then they criticize their own self instead of making other people responsible. So this is one of the rules uh, that we understood, one of the principles that we understood of correcting other people, which we understood from these people, is that when you correct other people, you don't use the word you, you always use the word we. Tonight, inshallah, the ayah that we are going to understand is ayah number 15, in which now they are talking to themselves. They are not talking to their nation, they are talking to themselves. And they say, This is our nation, this is our people. <coughs> they have taken other things beside Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They have made other gods besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why don't they prove this with evidence? Why don't they give evidence for this? Okay, if they are worshipping <coughs> idols, why don't they give evidence for this? And you know the evidence is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said. Evidence is something that the books have revealed. This is what we call evidence when it comes to religion. Evidence is not science when it comes to religion. Evidence is not logic when it comes to religion. Evidence is not rational when it comes to religion. Evidence is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala I'm talking about strictly about religion. I'm not talking about philosophy. I'm not talking about science here. I'm talking about religion. When it comes to religion, whatever you want to do, whatever you want to say, whatever you want to practice, whatever you want to pact upon, the evidence behind it is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said. And the evidence behind it is what the books have revealed. And this actually clearly shows us that our religion based upon evidence. It based upon evidence. If you remember, a few sessions ago, we learned something very important from the tafsir of the same surah. And what we learned is, one of the biggest sins in Islam is to speak about Allah with ignorance. One of the biggest sins in Islam is to speak about Islam with ignorance. One of the biggest sins in Islam is to say, I think Allah says this. I think Islam says this. One of the biggest sins. You can't just make things up in your head and say that Islam has said this. You can't do that. And this is the same thing that the youth are saying it here. They are saying to their people, they are challenging their people, that if you are worshipping idols, then give us a dalil. Give us an evidence. Where do you get this from? Who told you to do this? Which book revealed it? Which prophet revealed it? Which words revealed it? Which ayah revealed it? Give us an evidence. Because idolatry doesn't make sense with the prophets. It doesn't make sense with the intellect. And it doesn't make sense with the books. So give us a reason, give us a proof, give us an evidence, show us to us, show it to us that how you can worship idols. And then the last part of the ayah is, who does more wrong than a person who fabricate lies against Allah, who says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has children, who says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has other beings that should be worshipped instead of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who can be more wrongdoer than this person? Again and again, the point that is mentioned here, and if you go and look into any tafsir, the tafsir that I mostly, before preparing these sessions, the tafsir that I look into most of the time is Ma'arif al-Qur'an. And it says it very, very clearly that in this ayah, the key point for us Muslims, what we learn from the people of the cave in this ayah, in this, particularly in this ayah, is that be very careful what you say about Allah. 
Be very careful what you say about the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Anybody who dares to open his mouth, including myself, including any one of you, anybody who dares to open his mouth about Islam, about the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, must be 110% sure. He should know what he's talking about. Because when you speak on behalf of Allah, now you're responsible. Allah is monitoring what you said. And Allah will hold you accountable for that. We all know the hadith of Rasulullah, the well-known hadith of Rasulullah, Man kathiba alayya muta'ammidan. Whoever made a lie against me purposely, فَلْيَتَبَوَّعَ مَقْعَدَهُ مِنَ النَّارِ He should make his tikana, he should make his maq'ad in the fire of Jahannam. He should make his place in the fire of Jahannam. He deserved a place in the fire of Jahannam. This is the biggest lesson. These you, they said to their people that if you are worshipping idols, give us the dalil. You know, give us an evidence, tell us with an authority. So we understand that yes, you are doing it for a reason. Because of an evidence, on the basis of an evidence. The next ayah is a long ayah. I only have five minutes left. And I don't think that there are a number of issues that we need to discuss in the next ayah. Because it's a long ayah and it's a beautiful ayah. And I don't think that I will be able to do justice with the tafsir of the next ayah in five minutes. So we will focus more on this issue, on this subject. That don't talk about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without knowledge. Don't talk about the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without knowledge. Especially when it comes to the matters of fiqh. See, after the demise of Rasulullah, I can challenge all of you people here. I have done my research. The first thing when I came here to do my MPhil, the first research that I did, the first topic that I was given was ijma' consensus. And these are not just my findings, these are the findings of all the people who have done their research on consensus. That after the demise of Rasulullah in the matters of fiqh, I'm not talking about aqaid, I'm not talking about what we believe, what we don't believe, what is halal, what is haram. That's are clear and we all are on the same page when it comes to our aqaid, when it comes to halal and haram. I'm talking about the matters of fiqh. When it comes to legal matters, after the demise of Rasulullah there is not even a single instance when all Sahaba, I'm not talking about the scholars of today, I'm not talking about Paki scholars, Saudi scholars, Egyptian scholars, no. You know when I say something, first the, the first thing that people tell me, to, uh, the, the first thing or the first comment that people give me is that what does he know? He comes from Pakistan, he's a Paki Mulana. And Wallahi, I don't consider myself, I don't regard myself, you, you people, you people are witness to it that I never ask you and I never demand or I never said to anyone to call me an Imam or a Mulana. Anytime anyone refers to me as an Imam, I always tell them, call me brother, I'm more comfortable with the brother because I'm the student of knowledge. I don't, expert, I, don't, uh, I don't expect myself to be an expert and I don't consider myself to be an expert. Whatever I'm telling you is not my opinion, it's the opinion of the scholars that I follow. And they are the scholars, I'm not the scholars. So what I'm trying to say is that after the demise of Rasulullah wasallam, the Sahaba, there's not even a single instance when all Sahaba agreed upon one single way in the matters of fiqh. There have always been differences of opinion. Always been. But as long as you are within the premises of Sharia, Alhamdulillah, you have no right to shove your opinion down to my throat. I have no right to shove my opinion down to your throat. Alhamdulillah. When it comes to the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we should be very careful in both ways. We should fear making something haram that Allah has made halal. And we should fear making something halal that Allah has made haram. And we should not say anything about the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without knowledge. And this includes me as well. Don't you think that I'm just talking about the scholar? Again, let me make myself as explicit as I can. I am not a scholar. I am the student of knowledge. That's it. That's it. That's my qualification. I wanted to give you one story and then inshallah I'm done. Actually two stories, not one story. One story is about Sahaba and the other story is more like a contemporary story. There was this one Sahabi. <coughs> we have a book called Al-Hidayah and that story is mentioned in that book. It's a book of fiqh. There was this one Sahabi. He was about to pray after the demise of Rasulullah and he is about to pray. But before he started praying, he took off his upper cloth. He had his lower cloth on, which was covering his awrah. Which was covering the parts of his body that needs to be covered before you start praying your salah. <coughs> but he took off his upper piece of cloth and he put it on the stool right next to him. On a working stool right next to him and he started praying salah. Now this is a masla of praying salah in a single piece of cloth. Now this sahabi is praying salah with a lower piece of cloth. That is covering its aura but where is his upper piece of cloth? It's not like he's, he, he's deprived from his upper piece of cloth. Where is his upper piece of cloth? Right next to him, folded right next to him on the stool. Now there is this one observer who is watching him. The person who is reading his salah is a 
Sahabi, the companion. The person who is watching him, the observer who is watching him, he's not a Sahabi. He's watching him and he says to himself, look at him. And just like we say, when we see someone praying some, in a way that we don't pray. Look at him. Look at the way he's praying. It's not like he's derived, he's deprived. He took off his upper piece of cloth and put it right next to him on the stool. He has this cloth. Why can't he wear this cloth and read his namaz? So he, he waited until that Sahabi has completed his Salah. And when that Sahabi completed his Salah, he went up to him. He walked up to him. And he said to him, how can you pray your Salah like this? You have your upper piece of cloth folded right next to you on the stool. Why don't you wear it before you read it? Before you offer your Salah? And you know what he said? He said, I did this. I read my Salah in only one piece of cloth because I knew you were watching me. And I knew, I, I wanted you to come and ask me this question so I can tell an idiot like you that in the time of Rasulullah most of us had only one piece of cloth and that's how we used to pray. So it's permissible. And I wanted you to come and ask me, that's why I prayed it, deliberately, purposely. The reason that I'm sharing this story with all of you is that we need to be careful. We need to be careful. When it comes to the matter of fiqh, leave it to the scholars. Leave it to the people who know how to do it. You know, there are so many things. Look at this, look at how many exceptions there are. You know, look at how many, uh, uh, look, look what, the, what the simplicity of the religion is. Look what, are the, what, what is the diversity of the opinions among the leading scholars. There are so many complications. You can't just jump onto the conclusions. How often I see people telling me in the month of Ramadan, and you have heard these comments, I am never going to listen to the lecture of this Imam because he, and you know why? Because he prays his Eid Salah on a different day. No, I'm all for unity. Don't you think that I'm not all for you? I'm all for unity. But if someone is praying his Salah on a different day, is it a matter of halal and haram? Is it a difference of opinion that never existed before? And it's, it's not an imaginary conversation. I'm telling you what has been related to me. I don't consider this person an alim. You know why? I don't consider him an alim. You know why? Because he says that dogs are permissible in Islam. You don't know in what context he said this. In what context he said this. You can't just take one hadith of Rasulullah and one ayah of, hadith, one ayah of the Quran and just jump onto the conclusion. This is dangerous. You have to put every hadith, every ayah in its context and understand it accordingly. You know Alama Anwar Shah Kashmiri, contemporary example now. One of the scholars from Indo-Pak, but he was a scholar of Islam. It's not just he's a, he's a Paki scholar or Indian scholar. He was a scholar when India used to be British colony. <coughs> Alama and Mashah Kashmir, probably uh, the people from Pakistan, they are aware of his name. I met his son. He was a genius, absolute genius. What do you call it? He had this photographic memory. And I met his son once when I was studying in Pakistan. And I asked his son that, is it true about your father that whenever he would read something, he would never forget it? And he started laughing. And he said, you know, the scholars of the past, the scholars of the last century, most of the scholars, this was the most famous question that they used to ask my father. The scholars of the you know, past century, of the last century. <coughs> and my father used to tell them that if I read anything just by skimming through it, inshallah, I will not forget it for 30 years. And if I read something properly, then I will never ever forget it because Allah has blessed him with this memory, amazing memory. And not just amazing memory, his intelligence, his analytical skills, analytical or analytical, whatever you call it. Analytical skills, you know, his, his ability to reconcile different narrations, different reports. He had an outstanding ability. And he used to say, it's in his biography, the words that I'm going to tell you now. He used to say that I have an opinion on every single topic, meaning that I read, discuss and offer my opinion about every topic about every topic. He was a polymath. He was an expert of all the subjects. He even read philosophy. He was not just a Maulvi. He, just, he even read philosophy. Do you know about Iqbal? We in Pakistan call him Alama Iqbal. But do you know about Iqbal, right? <clears throat> he did his PhD from, in, in philosophy from a German university. And then he taught in Cambridge University. And in the, in the early part of the last century, Various, he was invited by various European governments to come to their universities and teach their students. And those lectures that he used to give were attended by leading scholars, leading orientalists, you know, uh, leading deans and, 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 and uh, chairholders and the most prestigious institutes and the most prestigious universities. He was regarded as a poet, but more important than a poet, he was regarded as a philosopher 
because he had a PhD in philosophy. He was a master of Urdu language. Uh, he was a master of English language. He was an expert in Persian language. And he did poetry in Urdu in, in, in Persian. Some of his works in poetry, in Persian poetry, was translated in English by his own teachers, by his own professors in the European universities. What I'm trying to say is that he was held in high regard by, by the entire world. Now, Iqbal had questions in his mind that he never found answers of. And the answer he had, he was deeply unsatisfied with those answers. He met many people. He corresponded with many people, but nobody was able to give him satisfactory answers to all of his questions. And he said in his bio, I don't remember his book, but if you Google, I will tell you later, inshallah. But he, he traveled all around the world. He had contacts in, in the European world, in Islamic world, in the Arab world. He had contacts all over the world. He traveled all over the world, but he said, I only found one person. I only corresponded with one person who gave satisfactory answers to all of my questions and he put my, my mind to rest. And these questions were heavy questions. These questions were about atheism, about universe, about the existence of God, about the existence of Allah. That he could never find answers. He was a philosopher but he could not understand these concepts. But the only person who was able to give him satisfactory answer and put his mind to rest was Allah Ma'an Shah Kashmir he was a genius, absolute genius. He used to say, I have an opinion in every single topic. But when it comes to the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, especially when it comes to the fiqh, I don't give any opinion. I don't innovate. I do my research and I follow opinions, but I don't give my own opinion. I do not innovate. And it's amazing that in every field, in every science, in every discipline, in every subject, in every field of learning, I have an opinion. But when it comes to the deen of Allah, when it comes to the fiqh, I'm quiet. I don't give my opinions. I do not innovate. The point of these two stories is just to illustrate that we need to be careful. And this is what we are also learning from the sunnah of the people of the cave. That if you are doing something, you need to have a dalil, you need to have an evidence. If you don't have an evidence, then be very, very careful. Don't go ahead of yourself. You know, when it comes to, uh, when it comes to ilm, leave it to ulama. When it comes to fiqh, leave it to fuqaha. When it comes to tahlil and tahreem, making of halal and making of haram, leave it to the people who have this ability, who Allah has given this responsibility and they have this ability. And just, expect, just, just accept the expertise of the experts. Just like we do in this dunya. We accept the expertise of a doctor, of an engineer. We accept the expertise of the experts in this dunya, in every field, in every subject, in every discipline. When it comes to the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then everyone is expert, other than the real expert. Everyone is an expert. So that's what we need to understand here. A very important lesson for myself and for all of you. Very, very important lesson. When it comes to the fiqh, and you will find a lot of difference of opinions. A lot of difference of opinions. But when it comes to the fiqh, be very, very careful. Even the Sahaba, they never agreed upon one single way after the demise of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Then who are you and me? So we have to be very, very careful. This is exactly what the people of the cave did. They said, لَوْ لَا يَأْتُونَ عَلَيْهِمْ بِسُلْطَانٍ بَيِّنْ Why don't you prove your idolatry with an authority? فَمَنْ أَظْلَمُ مِمَّنْ إِفْتَرَى عَلَى اللَّهِ كَذِبًا Who is more wrongdoer than a person who lies against Allah? So it's important that when we speak about Allah, we are very careful. We are 110% sure that whatever we are doing, whatever we are saying is true, and it's coming from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and we should have an evidence for it. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala